Now, this is a little bit extended reading, but I, I won't take but a moment. But just follow with me, if you would, in Genesis 4. This is God's Word. It's the truth. <clears throat> now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will, not, will, not, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer upon the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said, said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who find him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. He settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Then he built a city. He called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who played the lyre and the pipe. Zillah also born Tubal-Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Naamah. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's vengeance is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. The grass withers and the flower fades. God's word abides forever. By his grace and mercy, may his word be preached for you. Please be seated. I know you're sitting there um, and you've quickly noted that I am not preaching on the title or the text in the worship folder, and I'm not. Uh, that does not mean I'm not going to preach on that title and text. I am, God willing, in just a couple of weeks. But uh, because of a number of things and the leading of the Lord throughout this week, uh, I made uh, the decision uh, to put that sermon out a couple of weeks in order to come back and deal with a text that I've been examining and I felt it would be appropriate this week to do it and to preach on it. Uh, I want you to uh, just take a few moments and think through this with me. Now, wh Harry, why did you do that? Well, let me just give you a couple of reasons. The earlier service was the baccalaureate service. And while I certainly believe the revival under Hezekiah would have been appropriate, uh, as any passage of Scripture would be, I felt that there would be something more pointed toward our graduation, graduate speaker, graduate, graduates that I needed to speak about. And so that was one reason. Secondly, we're in the graduation season, and I wanted to give you some information that you could use from God's Word with graduates in your family and beyond. And then thirdly, uh, as many of you know, and I want to uh, just take a moment personally and pastorally, uh, try not to take too much from the sermon itself, but personally and pastorally to thank all of you for your communication throughout this week. Uh, this has been a, a very difficult time. Um, uh, this is kind of what we call, uh, well, what the Puritans called the hard providence of God. Um, in a broken world, we know God's providence is for His glory and our good. All things work together for good. 
to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. So we know that. But he doesn't say all things are good because we're in a broken world. And even when God is working good things for us and our glory, those good things include difficult things. The hard providences of God in a broken world. Uh, they're not easy. And uh, I, I confess to you, I'm in the midst of this and struggling with it uh, somewhat. I know the biblical truths. I cling to them. I'm looking to them. But uh, existentially and, and um, emotionally, uh, they're having to work their way into my life, which I am sure is going to take some time. Um, this week, of course, was a great week for my family in that uh, my oldest daughter was married uh, what an interesting moment. Um, you know, if you had told me 25 years ago that I was going to be in Birmingham, Alabama for the rest of my life, or unless you fire me, uh, for the rest of my life, and if you, and if you had told me that I was going to um, follow uh, one of my esteemed models for life and ministry, Dr. Frank Barker, and if you had told me that I was going to be able to minister in the same city with one of my uh, guys that I would go and talk to, Bill Hay, I mean, we kind of, us younger guys in those days, called them the Birmingham Mafia. And uh, so, to, and now, not only do, is Frank here, but uh, also uh, now Bill and I are in the same family as uh, his son and, and my daughter picked up where they left off at Breakaway at Jekyll Island in the uh, 11th grade. And uh, the Lord has taken them on a circuitous route, and now they've been joined together in the covenant of marriage through uh, many sh uh, life-shaping moments. And we are really so excited and so grateful and praise God for that. Well, there was no one who was more invested in this w wedding uh, beyond uh, perhaps uh, Jennifer herself uh, than her Aunt Vicki, uh, my uh, sister. Uh, she had already made four trips here for this wedding, was on her way to spend a week here, and uh, uh, Wednesday I got the news that uh, she and Calvin were in a uh, accident, a rather horrendous wreck, uh, right outside of Augusta, Georgia, which was quite challenging for me, and that, that is the, uh, the ancestral home of the readers, whatever that would mean, but that's five generations there. And um, so I, uh, it is there that the Lord chose to take her to be with himself. Uh, this is a hard providence for me for a number of reasons, not only what she was coming to be a part of and the occasion, but, but even more, she's my best friend, um, has been for, uh, other than Cindy, of course, uh, she is my best friend. Uh, for, and, and I've actually been best friends with her longer than I've been best friends with Cindy. She was my best friend for 65 years. And... Um, Probably no more than one or two days went by in a week that we weren't talking together, and praying together, challenging. I could always depend on her to defend me. I could always depend on she was one of the most loyal people you'd ever met in your life and a little hard-headed. I don't know where she got that, but she's a little hard-headed, uh, but unbelievably big-hearted. And, um, uh, well, just simply put, she was my best friend. And uh, so I've got this gigantic hole. I mean... You know, it's like yesterday, I leave the wedding, I call Vicky. Well, no Vicky to call. And uh, here, and, uh, and where she is, she wouldn't want to be bothered uh, with my phone call. So uh, that's, um, that's part of, there's some other things related to that that I won't take the time from the sermon to walk through. But it's a, it's a difficult providence for me. And as much as I appreciate the text I was going to preach on, I just really felt in light of all of these things, it was time. And by the way, she dearly loved y'all. I mean, she loved this church and had developed unbelievable friends. And it usually took her about an hour and a half to develop these relationships here. She, I mean, she kind of thought, she thought y'all were, I mean, I used to every once in a while, I said, no, they're not really as great as you think they are. And, uh, and, and but, uh, but she just thought y'all were unbelievable. And of course I agreed with her, but, uh, um, and th this was kind of like her Camelot, uh, that she saw. And, uh, um, so she loved to come here and, and was so looking forward to being here, coming for the marriage feast and the marriage celebration and all that was about to take place. 
So um, for a variety of reasons, it was a challenge. Uh, this, is, this has become quite a, a challenge for me. Just pray for me and that uh, I'll do what I preached last week uh, from Je the life of Jehoshaphat. Our eyes are on you, O Lord. Uh, so that would be, that's, all, that's the only answer in these matters. So, um, uh, and then, of course, continue to pray for Calvin, who has survived the accident and, uh, and that we can minister to him. So, uh, with that in mind, I was just kind of working my way through this, and I went back to this text that I had been working on. Now, we have been studying, we have said we want to study revival this year. Psalm 85, 6, revive us again, O Lord. Now, when we say revive us again, we know a couple of things quickly. Number one is this. If we ask God to revive us again, that means that we, to some degree, must be faithless if he has to keep coming back to revive us. But yet, isn't it glorious that God is so persistent and relentless that he does revive us again and again and again? And then secondly, secondly, that text tells us that God does not rejoice in our unfaithfulness, but he does rejoice in reviving his people. He loves to revive his people. And we actually studied how he does that in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name, one, humble themselves, two, pray, three, turn from their wicked way, four, seek my face, then I will, one, hear from heaven, two, forgive their sins, three, heal them and their land. And that's what he does. That's the promise to his covenant people. That's the design. So here's what we have learned about revival. Revival is not an objective. A revival is a divine corrective. The objective is God's people enjoying the power and presence and intimacy of the Lord to accomplish that which the Lord has called them to do. That's why we put down as our definition of revival that revival is an extraordinary work of God's grace. Extraordinary. He brings what's dead back to life. He takes a valley of bones and turns it into a glorious army to serve him. And so it is an extraordinary work of God's grace that God God does through ordinary people in ordinary places at ordina through an ordinary means, preaching, prayer, fellowship, worship. He uses those things to bring revival to his people. So it is an extraordinary work of grace through ordinary people in ordinary places through ordinary means for extraordinary purposes. Those extraordinary purposes are twofold. One is that God's people say no to idolatry and self-exaltation and yes to God-centered worship. And number two, that God's people not only reach up in worship, they reach out with the gospel and on the heels of revival come gospel harvest where many, many can be brought to Christ. And folks, while I rejoice and will continue to rejoice in the Briarwood commitment that I inherited and hopefully have engaged in along with you to be a world missions church sending the gospel to all the nations with, a, with sacrificial praying, giving, and going, I also believe that if you have a true heart for the nations, you have a primary heart for the nation where you find yourself. Just as Calvin sent 1,300 missionaries to France, his home country, and made his own trips at the risk of his life to try to encourage the Huguenot church under persecution. Just as John Knox, when he left, Cle when he left Geneva and arrived back in Scotland under the threat of his life said, give me Scotland or I die. Just as Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley tied to the post and the flames beginning to lick their bodies to their destruction. Latimer would turn to Ridley and say, Be of good cheer, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. For today you and I shall light a candle for Christ that shall never be put out in all of England. It is that heart that beats within God's people that the gospel to the nations would begin with power in their own nation. But you can't have a gospel harvest without a revived church. You can't have God-centered worship. You can't have a gospel harvest without a revived church.
And God brings revival. Only God can send. Revival cannot be worked up. It must come down. But God has said to his people, here's where I bring it down. I use revival leaders. I use revival preaching. I bring revival where my people humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face. That's where I move. Now, why do we know God moves there? Because we won't humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, and turn from our wicked ways if he hasn't already started moving on us. The very four elements that bring revival are the evidences of God's already present reviving work. So here is this glorious truth of revival, and God does it again and again. Well, if God does revival again and again, now hang with me here. If God does revival again and again, that means if he does it again, he did it before, right? Am I, is that correct? Somebody from Alabama, tell me. That's University of Alabama. Okay, good. All right, I just want to make sure. All right, so do you know that it, you know if he revives and he revives again, if he revives and he revived before. Well, somewhere there was the first revival. Right? Hello? Somewhere there was the first revival. Okay, you know, the Auburn people woke up. Good, all right. So now, so now, so you know there was a first revival. And we know where the first revival was. Adam and Eve sinned. And when they sinned, God made a wonderful promise of a covenant of grace that he would send through the woman a redeemer who would defeat Satan, sin, death, hell, and the grave. And then Adam and Eve have their first child, and Eve doesn't know whether this is the one or not. So she names her firstborn, Cain. I have received a man-child from the Lord. Is this the one? Then she has another child, Abel. And again, God's sovereignty is seen is that it's not the firstborn through which the line of redemption is coming. It's the secondborn, Abel. And that secondborn, Abel, manifested his love for the Lord, and Cain manifested his sin nature untouched by God's redeeming grace. Where? They manifested it right where you are right now in a worship service. You didn't find out, the Bible does not reveal the lostness of Cain and Abel in their off hours, in their hobbies. They reveal it, the Bible reveals their lostness in a worship service. And it wasn't that one worshiped and the other one didn't. Both came. But one worshiper was acceptable. The other one wasn't. And at what element of the worship service did the heart become exposed? Well, we just finished that. When we stood to sing the doxology and brought the offering before God. It was in the worship service, specifically the offering moment, that the heart of the two worshipers were revealed. And it wasn't that one had something and the other one didn't. It was that one. And, they t and the Bible takes great pains to point out to us their occupations. One was a shepherd of the sheep. One was a farmer. And so, rightly so, when they come to worship, they bring their offering from their occupation. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem was not the substance of their offering. The problem was the heart of those bringing the offering. And the Bible indicates it when it shows that Cain brought some of the fruit of the ground. Abel brought the first of the sheep, the tithe. And that wasn't enough for him. He brought also the fat portions, the best sacrificial offerings to go with the tithe. Cain 
Oh, see, offering, yeah, what have I got here? Here, here, here's something. He brought some of the fruit of the ground. Abel, well, if you brought the first of the flock, that means you saved the first of the flock for that special thing of giving praise to God. We bring to God the first. What should, Ab- what should Cain have brought? The first fruits, not the leftovers. The first fruits. What did Abel bring? The first of the flock and the fat portions, the best pieces of it. That's what he brought. So God has regard and affirms the true worship that's indicated in the offering by Abel, and he brings to Cain, your worship is not acceptable. So what does Cain do? Repent? No. No. Cain becomes angry against God. And God says, Cain, your problem is your heart. Right now, sin is crouching at the door and ruling it. You need my grace so that you can have dominion over the sin and kill it. And then when he gives the consequences of his sin, as God applies it to him, does Cain repent and say, oh, God, you are right and just? No, he says, God, what you're doing is not just. And then God's forbearance and grace is seen, at least in common grace, as he says, okay, I will withhold any immediate and ultimate judgment. You'll be a wanderer and a fugitive, and I'll put a mark on you so so that people don't kill you for what you're doing. And God shows his grace and his mercy even to the one who is arrogant before him. And does the arrogance end there? No, no. The arrogance continues. Because not only, not only does he rebel against God in the worship service, but now under the disciplining hand of God, and God says, you're going to be a wonder and a fugitive. He says, no, I won't. I'll build a city. And the city is built as a statement of rebellion against God. And then not only will I build the city, I'm going to put my son's name on it. And he puts the name of his son upon it. And then as he continues in generation after generations, it goes on for seven generations. And things are invented because of God's common grace, because we're, we're, born, uh, we're born depraved and spiritually depraved. At least God has, has restrained the effects of that depravity so even lost people can get something right and so they invent the, the, the elements, the bronze, the, the working instruments. They, they deal with the matter of livestock. And there is, there is instrumentation that's developed. But it's all about Cain and his family. Nothing to the glory of God. And so you see the descent and the death spiral of a culture that's apart from God's grace. We need an awakening. That means we need a revival. And a revival only comes from God. God, will you send revival? And God sends the first revival in the Bible by sending a revival leader. Take your Bibles and look back with me to where I finished reading in chapter 4. And see what happens next after this description that we've just walked our way through. In verse 25, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel. For Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born. And he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. When? With Enosh. Enosh, sent from God through Seth, who was sent to replace Abel, now in this covenant of grace line, now in this redeeming line, now in this This kingdom of light and grace line, through that line comes Enosh. And Enosh, Adam's still living. Eve is still living. Uh, Not only are they living, but their father, Seth, is living. And as they rise up 
and you've already seen the, the distillation and death spiral of, that's going on in the kingdom of darkness from the line of Cain. Right in the midst of it, in the midst of all that's going on, God sends Enosh. And what is stated about Enosh at that time? People, men and women, began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Call upon the name of the Lord. That phrase is used in three different ways in your Bible. Number one, call upon the name of the Lord is a phrase describing gathered worship. That God's people come together and call upon the name of the Lord. It is, it is describing public worship. The second thing that that phrase is used for, calling upon the name of the Lord is another phrase to describe intercessory prayer. Calling upon the name of the Lord to intercede. It describes prayer. So calling upon the name of the Lord describes public worship. Calling upon the name of the Lord describes intercessory prayer. Thirdly, calling upon the name of the Lord describes what those who are being saved are doing. The Bible says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear him without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? But Isaiah says, Lord, they have not all believed our report. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the glad tidings of good things because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. So to be saved, you have to call upon the name of the Lord. To call upon the name of the Lord, you have to hear the Lord. To hear the Lord, God has to send someone who brings the name of the Lord to you. I thank God that I've been given that privilege as a minister of the gospel and I don't want to waste a single day. But I also thank God that he sent Enosh long before he ever sent me. <laughs> now, you're talking about an ordinary person. Here's ordinary. Enosh, that's all we know. What do we know about Enosh? Well, his uh, granddaddy was Adam. His daddy was Seth. His daddy was a gift from God to replace Abel. His daddy was faithful. Enosh was faithful. Next thing we know is in Enosh's life, men and women called upon the name of the Lord. How'd you like to finish your life and that's all that's written about you? Harry Reader. In his time, people called upon the name of the Lord. Now that is a tombstone. In just a few days, <laughs> I'm going to be giving a task that I have had four times in my life. I'll have it with my sisters and Vicki's husband, but I've already been tasked with it. My sisters' remains are going to be set aside, and we're going to put a tombstone. What are we going to write there? What are we going to put there? How are we going to sum up 65 years? And if you want me to sum up, this won't go on the tombstone, but this is one way I could do it. Hard-headed but big-hearted. That was my sister. Wow. I've never seen a heart that big in all my life. It's unbelievable. Also had a hard head. Thankfully, that part didn't come to me in the family genetic structure. Um, why are you laughing? I don't understand that. The first time that came to me was my granddaddy. He came to me in the late 1980s, and he said to me, he said, son, I think it won't be long till I'll meet the Lord. He said, now, what I want you to do is preach my funeral. And I said, granddaddy, <laughs> I don't think I can do that. My grandparents were 36 years old when I was born. I mean, I, went, I may have gone through adolescence before my granddaddy did. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, uh, I mean, I was really close uh, to my dad and mom and my grandparents. 
And um, so I, when he said, I said, Granddad, I'm just not sure I can do that. And he said, I said, I don't think I'd be comfortable. And he said, well, son, I don't really care if you're comfortable or not. Uh, you're going to preach my funeral. And he said, and I'm giving you two instructions. Can you follow these? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, instruction number one, you have it in my, and he named his church that he grew up in. And he said, you have it in that church. And when the, recept, when the receiving's over, close the casket, push it to the side. And then you tell them about Jesus. Jesus hadn't been preached in that church in 25 years. And if I got to die to get it in there one more time, I'm going to do that. And I said, yes, sir. And then he said, I said, what's number two, granddaddy? He said, tombstone. Here's the plot. Westview Cemetery. I'd cleaned that plot many times of, his, of my grandmother's parents who were buried there as a kid. That's where we'll be buried. Here's the tombstone. Put my name, put my birth date, put my death date, and then write one word. Forgiven. And that's your sermon. Forgiven. I had a second task when my dad, who had been a prodigal for 14 years and had come back to the Lord for 11 glorious years, I uh, didn't have the task to work on that one. That wasn't hard. <laughs> Here lies a poor sinner saved by the grace of God. And then my mother, who was the most astounding woman I ever met until I met Cindy. You see, I got out of that one, didn't you? You thought I was in trouble. <laughs> until I met Cindy. And then, uh, so that went, on the, that went on the tombstone. An excellent wife, who can find? Only God makes them like that. Praise the Lord. So now I've got a fourth time. And I'm still working on it, and I'm still thinking about it. And I know my sisters are going to have input. And I know Calvin will have his insight. But I began to think about it. And one of the reasons I came to this is that there are kind of like tombstone verses in the Bible. One of them for me is Acts 13, 36. David, after he had served God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers. Wouldn't you love for somebody at the end of your life to say, he served God's purpose. Or Paul, I finished the race. I have fought the good fight. I've been poured out as a drink. Not a, not a burnt offering, you got ashes left. A drink offering, there was nothing left. When I got to the end, I'd given it all for Jesus. So there awaits for me a crown that will become his worship resource for all eternity as he brings the crown back to Jesus. So there are some amazing verses that are there. I've always thought this one was. The first revival, the first revival leader, the first revival preacher, and the only thing we know about it. Listen to all the theft that's written. Lamech, hey man, I'm going to write a song about me. You think Cain something? I killed a boy. I killed a, I killed a young man. You think Cain? You think Cain gets uh, protected sevenfold? Me, I'm seventy-seven fold. I mean, Lamech was the first Frank Sinatra crooner, and that was his version. I did it my way which happens to be the most requested funeral song in America today. That tells you why we need a revival. I did it my way. <laughs> you see the arrogance of the line of Cain, and you see the simple statement, Seth replaced Abel. Enosh came from Seth. Put this one on the tombstone. 
In the time of Enosh, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Does that mean prayer? Yes. Does that mean worship? Yes. Does that mean gospel evangelism? Yes. Harry, which one of those three do you think? It, I think it's all three. Because I think when you get saved, you worship. And I think when you get to get saved, you got to start praying. They call upon the name of the Lord. That's what happened. And so here is the glory of it and the majesty of it. I, can't, I don't know how I'm going to put this into words, and maybe I can't. But this is where I'll leave you, just to sit and think about this. My sister, who would, wanted to be here today, and wanted to be here yesterday for that marriage ceremony, marriage face, she was all into that. My sister, I realized, is a picture of all of you who know Jesus. So if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, what well, my sister was a picture of you. If you know Jesus, according to Revelation chapter 19, do you know where we're headed? We're all on a journey to a marriage feast. And unless Jesus comes back first, death will interrupt that journey. My sister was on the way to a marriage feast. And on Interstate 20, mile marker 188, death interrupted the journey. And she went to a greater marriage feast, the one she was always moving toward. So, friend, where are you headed? I had a chance to speak to the graduates earlier, so I asked them the same question. Where are you headed? Over here today, the fellow that spoke for YBL, Bernard Longer, has got a chance to win this tournament again. <laughs> Amazing golfer. Um, I had the chance to play a little golf in college, and I got a chance to play a lot of golf since then, a lot of it with y'all. I, you know, I get up on the first tee, I have two swing thoughts on the first tee. Do you want my two swing thoughts on the first tee now? Here's the first swing thought I have. Oh, God, please do not let me totally embarrass myself. I then have a, that is soon followed by a second swing thought slash prayer request. Oh, God, after I hit this ball, I would like to be able to find it. Those are my two thoughts. Bernard Langer is not thinking that when he gets to the first tee. That's not what he's thinking. In fact, when he's on that first tee, he's not on that first tee. Do you know where he is? He's on the green. He's going to birdie the hole. And there's a little place on that green that where there's a slight uphill, no break, six-foot putt for a birdie. That's where he's going to be on that green. Well, to be there on the green, there's a certain place he needs to be in the fairway so that he can be right there on the green. And to be in the fairway, he needs to be there to be there on the green so he can sink that putt and get the birdie. Now he's ready to hit his drive. Here's what I told the students. Here's what I'm telling you. You don't begin at the beginning. You begin from the end. Those students graduating, I'm sure they're all going on a trip this afternoon. <laughs> the highway they get on will be determined by the destination they've chosen. So are you headed for the marriage feast of the Lamb? Have you made that decision that by God's grace, Jesus is your life. If that's the case, then someday, somebody will be able to stand at your grave, look at the tombstone, and not only say they're with the Lord, they'll be able to write, in their day, men and women called upon the name of the Lord. Now that's glorious. 
That's something to live for. People ask me, Harry, how did your sister die? I know what they're doing. But you know what I answer? She died the way she lived. Therefore, to die was gain. Because to live was Christ. Not with perfection. But with the steady drumbeat of God's relentless grace in Jesus Christ. For me, to live is Christ. Is that your decision? Then the people who are left, when death finds you and takes you to that marriage feast, they will ultimately have joy in what they write on the tombstone, knowing what God has done and is doing with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the moments we could be together this day in your word. Thank you for coming to meet with us. We would behold our God who sits upon the throne. There is none like him. We surrender to you. And today, if you haven't yet surrendered to Christ and and made Jesus your destination in life, for life, and for eternity. There's a prayer team that will be to my left. Just make your way over. They would love the privilege to confidentially and personally pray with you. And if you have done that, then ask the Lord that every moment of life will be Jesus. And, oh, God, the revival we need out there begins right here. And the revival we need here begins in me. I would choose Jesus. Help me. In Jesus' name, amen.